I had made up my mind to serve in the military when I was in elementary school. My, my dad was drafted during the Korean War. He's my hero. Hi, I'm Jay Ruderman, and welcome to All About Change, a podcast showcasing individuals who leverage the hardships that have been thrown at them to better other people's lives. This is all wrong. I I say um, put mental health first because if you don't... This generation of America has already had enough. I stand before you not as an expert, but as a concerned citizen. In 2007, U.S. Army Captain Leroy Torres was deployed to Balad, Iraq. One of the first things that I remember was the smell in the air, the stench. It was Leroy's first encounter with a burn pit. Imagine a large open area, sometimes the size of multiple football fields, where every form of trash, electronics, plastics, medical waste, everything is dumped and set on fire. And this fire, It burns all day, every day. I said, well, don't worry about it. It's being handled by the contractors. It wasn't long before Leroy started experiencing health problems, problems that would follow him home well after his deployment was over. My supervisor came in and said, hey, uh, you can't no longer come back to work. Uh, There's something wrong with you. You may be contagious. After failing to get the help he needed, Leroy and his wife set out on what would literally be the fight for his life. But it wasn't only himself they were fighting for. My wife, she told me, no matter the outcome, no matter the results that we get, I'm going to fight for you and I'm going to fight for others because this is not going to be the end. They were fighting for benefits and recognition for thousands of affected veterans, including Bo Biden, the son of President Biden, who died of a glioblastoma in 2015 at the age of 46. Just a heads up, Leroy uses a ventilator and still has difficulty in his daily life due to his health. You'll hear this in the audio. Captain Leroy Torres, thank you so much for being my guest on All About Change. I want to start off by saying that I am extremely impressed with your activism. I've never been an individual who has both won a Supreme Court case and changed a major piece of federal legislation. So congratulations on your activism. I know that it's affected thousands of lives in our country. First of all, let me ask you, how are you feeling these days? Uh, well, Jay, first off, thank you for having me. And, and for this, uh, today has been a little challenging for me. It has. Uh, aside from my respiratory issue, the toxic brain injury, uh, I now battle GI issues. And lately, I've had the uh, intermittent bleeding episodes. And thankfully, it's kind of been resolving you know, slowly. But uh, I can say uh, uh, today has been <laughs> been a somewhat a challenging day. I'm sorry to hear that. Maybe I can take you back to the beginning of your career in the United States Army. Maybe you could tell us why you chose to enlist and when did that happen? Actually, I had made up my mind to serve in the military when I was in elementary school. My, my dad was drafted during the Korean War and he was drafted in 1950. So my dad was my... Uh, was my hero, you know, growing up. And I made a decision early in life to join. And at, at 17, as soon as I was able to uh, to enlist, I, I enlisted in the Army National Guard. Of course, it was challenging for my mother because she had to uh, to sign since I was uh, considered, a, you know, under 18, minor. It was very difficult for her, but my dad had no, no problem. He was, of course, he was proud. At the same time, knowing that I was choosing to go into the military that perhaps maybe come with challenges and uh, but uh, my dad was one who particularly inspired me to join uh, the military and serve in the army when i first enlisted my my specialty was 11 bravo an infantryman so i was still a junior in high school uh, so upon my uh, completion of my junior uh, year i i uh, traveled to fort benning georgia for basic training at the u.s army infantry uh, training center and completed basic training then I returned back uh, to Texas and completed my senior year. And a week after my graduation, uh, many of my friends were headed to their senior trips and so forth. And I was headed back to Fort Benning for uh, infantry school. So tell us, you, you were deployed in 2007. Can you talk us through that time, what happened, uh, how you were deployed, and where you ended up? 
I had just taken my dad to the VA uh, clinic for one of his appointments. And we're sitting in the coffee shop having lunch after we're talking about a uh, situation in, in Iraq. And, you know, that's a good thing you haven't been deployed yet. And I said, I know that it's been, it's been, I'm pretty sure, you know, eventually my number will come up. Not even 10 minutes went by, my phone rang. And it was my, my immediate supervisor, uh, uh, my major. He goes, uh, well, I said, your number's been called. You're, you're going to Iraq. November of 07, I, I, I deployed to Iraq. And the challenging thing about it was that I was deployed with a totally different unit. Uh, I didn't know anyone in the unit. I was an individual augmentee to a unit out of Rock Island, Illinois. The Army created this one unit and brought uh, men and women from different parts of the of, of the U.S. and uh, put a unit together and deployed us to, to Iraq. Initially, I was supposed to go to Afghanistan as a, a company commander for a detachment. And while I was at Rock Island, Illinois, my orders changed. I said, no, you're going to Iraq to a a logistics uh, brigade, a combat support. There was a uh, department of uh, defense personnel working as well as contractors. And, and our mission was, was to lead the logistical effort uh, there in, in Balad, Iraq, and to other surrounding FOBs, pretty much handling uh, battle damage equipment that was coming back to through Balad and uh, sending it back to, to the United States. Were you in barracks? Were you in tents? What, what was the situation like there? The living situation in Balad was we were housed. Uh, they called them CHUs, uh, see, uh, containerized housing units. And, and there were these uh, pretty much the least metal boxes that that uh, we shared a latrine with the, another person. And uh, you know, had a what, twin bed in there. And uh, it, it was, you know, it was it was, uh, it was small, but but yet comfortable. And of course. One of the first things that I remember arriving in Balad and stepping off the shuttle was the smell in the air, the stench. And me, having a law enforcement background, I asked a lot of questions. I started in- investigating. What One of my first questions was, what is that smell? Is this legal? Can they do this? So, oh, that's the burn pit. That's the burn pit. That's where everybody throws all their waste and, and burn it. And of course, eventually I was just told to kind of stay in my lane that it was handled by contractors. So let's talk a little bit about what a burn pit is for listeners who who may not know. Was it used for how close were troops to the burn pits? A burn pit is pretty much just imagine a huge hole, or we can picture a landfill, where all your daily trash, from plastic to styrofoam, you name it, everything that was thrown into the trash plus tires, batteries, equipment, was uh, doused with JPA fuel and, and burned. Some people, well, it's just a small hole, but this this pit was uh, 10 acres in diameter. Oh. That's how big it was there in Balad, Iraq. What is the, the, the rationale behind a burn pit as opposed to carting off the garbage or even, bar- you're in the desert, so even like, you know, taking a, a tractor and and burying it in the sand. The the thing about a purpose was a, a expedient way to to rid of waste, and it it was convenient. It was there on post, so it was one of those things where you don't have to spend all that time digging a massive hole and burying it, but just bringing it to the pit and and burning it, get rid of it as fast as they could. Burn pits were uh, they were in operation twenty four seven. There were times where you you could see just the, the smog just hovering over over the area. At times, I would walk out in the mornings uh, outside my uh, my housing quarters, my living quarters, and I could just wipe the AC, the unit, and the set from uh, from debris from from the pit. And that, that's how how serious this, this issue became. I remember going to the uh, urgent care. December 30th, because I kept my sick call slip, and I remember I had a really bad uh, respiratory. I was having a, a, a horrible cough, and just, I know I was coming down with, like, I had a, I had a bad cold. Well, they said, you have a bad uh, upper respiratory infection. And they said, well, you just your body's just adjusting to the racket crud, and it was going to take me a couple of weeks. 
to, to acclimatize to, to the environment. So I was placed on quarters for 72 hours. Yeah, I had a really bad uh, upper respiratory infection, gave me antibiotics and uh, quarantined me for 72 hours. I also had really bad abdominal pain at the same time. And what was it like for your fellow soldiers? I mean, was anyone raising an issue saying, hey, this might not be the healthiest uh, environment? And, and, you know, were there other soldiers that were experiencing symptoms that you saw? Comments were made and, of course, other, just speaking within our, our unit, uh, they were just, well, this, they're developing this dry cough. Uh, some are having uh, uh, sinus issues. And, of course, when we go to the urgent care, they would just tell us, well, it's just uh, we were dealing with Iraqi credit. So, in other words, it, it was something that wasn't really talked about at that time because they said, well, don't, don't worry about it. It's being handled by the contractor. So we would, you know, at times comment on it, but it was something that, that we were trusting uh, the government that, that it was okay what they were doing that uh, eventually it was just going to pass and that we would get back home and, and that things would, would resolve eventually. So I know you just described some symptoms and, and some upper respiratory uh, issues that you were having at the time and, and GI issues. Um, were there other issues that, that developed over time uh, that weren't as immediate? Uh, one of the, for, for me, was the, the headaches, waking up with... Uh, with headaches. I remember towards the end, maybe about midways, closer to the end of my uh, deployment, I remember wake, waking up with headaches and I'm thinking, well, it's just, uh, you know, something I'm dealing with, so I'll just take, take some medication. But I remember once I came home, that they started to get worse. When, once I, I, I returned from the deployment. And of course, the, re the respiratory issue that, that did become uh, problematic. Uh, I, I actually went a couple of times to uh, urgent care while I was there in Balad, you know, and it was pretty much the same thing. Well, here, here's a Z pack, take it for five days, stay hydrated, and drive on. And me, me growing up in that era of the army where it was suck it up and drive on, I didn't, I wasn't a complainer, so I would just take my medicine, and you know, of course, the headaches are something that I just dealt with until I came back home. Uh, approximately three weeks after. I returned from deployment, I ended up in the emergency room. And I remember talking, uh, of course, explaining to the emergency room doctor, I had the uh, horrible cough and that I had the, like, I had a pretty bad respiratory infection. And uh, he was just starting asking me questions if I was around any chemicals or had been exposed to anything. And uh, when I mentioned that I was exposed to these burn pits that were in Iraq, he, he says, I'll be right back. And then he came, he came back with a mask. And uh, he goes, well, I said, uh, maybe it's uh, eventually your body will just, uh, you know, return back to normal from your exposure, whatever you're exposed to. But uh, say it was the same thing, kind of gave me, uh, just uh, put a Band-Aid on the issue, just gave me medication for the respiratory infection, something for the cough. That's when uh, flags went up and, and uh, even in talking to my wife, because she, has, she had already picked up on the issue that I had to dry cough and the horses of my voice while I was at the end of my deployment, but I wouldn't tell her how, you know, the issues that I was having, because I, I didn't want to worry her and I didn't want to, to think uh, that something was wrong. But when I came back home, that's when I noticed yeah, the change. I saw an interview that your wife gave where she said, my husband went off to Iraq as a healthy person and the person that returned and got off the plane was not the same person. I'm sorry for everything that you've gone through, especially because you, you know, have served our country with uh, distinction. What about your fellow soldiers or senior leadership? How did they react to your illness? Before I left Iraq, I remember being handed a memo from uh, Lieutenant Colonel Curtis, Air Force uh, Lieutenant Colonel. It explained the issue with the potential as uh, the burn pits having I mean, being hazardous to our health and kind of here, take this, you might need this later. And that's when I kind of figured where eventually this issue was going to uh, be a huge problem for us. And maybe you can tell us a little bit about your experience with the Veterans Administration, with the VA. Did they offer support? You know, did they give you, you know, financial or, or medical? How did that work out for you? 
At the start, it was a tremendous challenge. I remember traveling to uh, Vanderbilt University Hospital to see Dr. Robert Miller about my respiratory issue. Right before that, I was admitted to the VA War Related Illness and Injury Study Center in DC. And this was after I had been dismissed from my uh, civilian job. In August of 2010, they had said, my, my supervisor came in and said, hey, uh, we, you can't no longer come back to work. Uh, there's something wrong with you. You may be contagious. You need to get you need to get checked. Well, that's what led us into this uh, pressure of finding answers. But uh, the dealing with the VA was very challenging for us. And knowing that while I was there visiting Dr. Robert Miller and, and talking to some of the, the personnel working that they were sending soldiers to see Dr. Robert Miller, but eventually it became an issue because of the diagnosis of the findings. So he was advised, you know, words, to change the diagnosis or, you know, they would stop sending soldiers, which eventually they did. Thankfully, I was, as a reservist, I had my private insurance where this is how I was able to, to see Dr. Robert Miller. But uh, knowing that I was trying to get support from the VA was, was very challenging. And even my wife asked there at, at the risk center in D.C. if they would do a lung biopsy. This is around October uh, 2010. And they said, no, it's, we, uh, it's not possible. We don't have the resources to do, to do a lung biopsy. But at that time, my wife had already been in touch with Dr. Robert Miller, who, you know, he wasn't encouraging it, but because of my job of wanting answers, that that'd be the only way to, uh, to discover my lung injury was through a biopsy, in which we move forward with that. So let me just understand, the VA, did they understand that, that your medical situation was caused by exposure to burn pits? I had to prove my case. We started the process around 2010, the end of 2010, 2011. And finally in 2013, but not until the Army Reserve came up with their findings through the line of duty, that's when the VA approved my, my case, approved my, my claim. Because the Army discovered it, and now it's like, well, they, they couldn't, <laughs> you know, evidence was there, the biopsy. And uh, so they had, in other words, they were pretty much had no choice at that time already. It was a, a case by case basis for me, but I had, I had to prove my case to, to, to receive treatment. Going back to the initial interaction, you know, when you're exposed to hazardous materials, there may not be a direct immediate correlation. Sometimes diseases develop over a period of time to put the impetus on on you as the soldier to prove that this was caused by exposure to the burn pits seems to be onerous when you're developing these conditions over a period of time. You know, it was very uh, disheartening for that, that burden of proof to, to be on the soldier, the veteran, uh, especially when the doors were closing and especially me serving as a reservist, which made it a, a huge challenge. I remember my wife taking me to uh, Brook Army Medical Center. And at that time, there was a, a study called, it's called a stampede study. And they were actually doing research on soldiers returning back with toxic exposure issues. But the, I didn't qualify because I wasn't an active duty soldier. So knowing that already that uh, the Department of Defense was not supporting my issue. And the obstacles that I was facing with the VA made it very challenging for me. And at the same time, I had a civilian employer who was also placing that burden on me as well. Like, you can't come back to work until you have answers. But I couldn't get an answer because of the delay and the denial issue at that time. Can you tell our listeners about the extent of your medical condition? Because I, I know it's it's not just the, the respiratory issues and the GI issues, but there was also some issues related to your brain. In 2018, I was diagnosed with a toxic encephalopathy. It's a toxic brain injury for, uh, for 10 years. I, I, I struggled with uh, these horrific headaches, uh, with horrific cluster headaches, waking up with these headaches. I remember one of the uh, episodes that I had, I had this headache for eight days. And uh, uh, it started affecting my, my short-term memory, 
my cognitive until 2018. So 10 years after I started having these cluster headaches, uh, I was finally diagnosed and had answers. I was actually went to a, a company, it's called a, a SEER scan, and they did a, a it's called the QSPECT. And it was a, a two day evaluation, of course, a scan of my brain. And they discovered that there were certain areas in my brain that were compromised and uh, areas in my brain were not receiving adequate blood flow. And that's what made it a very challenging for me. So I was prescribed a supplemental oxygen to alleviate these headaches and to prevent the episodes of these cluster headaches. So I, let's, let's go back to, you come back from Iraq and you have several illnesses. You're still a Texas state trooper. What happens at that time? I mean, you're having discussions with, with, with your superiors about how you could continue to work for the state of Texas. And tell us what happened at that time. Once uh, I came back from uh, seeing Dr. Miller and had received my results from the biopsy, of course, I'm uh, thinking, well, now that I have the answer, I'll be allowed to go back to work uh, in a different capacity because I already knew my, my limitations and uh, what this disease, this permanent injury had done. So when I presented the biopsy and I I filed a, uh, a request for uh, accommodation, I was granted a temporary position, a modified position, but it was only for a short while. And as I uh, requested a permanent modification, that's when the, the challenge began with the state. Knowing that I uh, had attempted to follow a, a process through ADA and that I had done everything in my in my power to follow the accommodation, you know, in a timely manner, it was something that kind of fell through. There was a drop in communication. They were not uh, providing me that opportunity to uh, remain employed. Uh, I remember that I was handed a, a memorandum from my supervisor saying, you can, due to your medical conditions, you're no longer able to serve as a state trooper. And when I received that memorandum, that was very uh, disheartening. So not only uh, having challenges on the VA DOD side, but now my civilian employer, it became a very uh, difficult season in my life. My understanding is that the state of Texas is now telling you, okay, you have to leave your job in order to receive disability which is what you did. But then when you went and applied for disability, you were denied. Right. And, and, and why, I, I, that's not clear to me. Like why, why, you know, if they forced you through this process where they said, okay, you can no longer be a, a Texas state trooper. You have to, you know, go on disability and, and you have to lose your job to do that. Why at that point deny you disability? And that's what didn't make sense uh, to me that uh, when I asked the question about well, why am I being forced to go this route where it seems like it's backwards because then if my disability is not approved, then I'm out of a job. But it's just the way that uh, I believe it was something with, with, with communication through my leadership and headquarters and eventually which led to, well, we don't know what else to do with you. So the option is to resign. And of course, at that time, I was receiving treatment in Utah for, uh, I was in Utah for 40 days going through a uh, program for uh, where they were detoxing first responders uh, due to the work they were doing around meth labs. And uh, they had, uh, of course, reached out hey, for me to have an opportunity to see if it would help my ailments at that time in 2012. So throughout this time that I'm being forced to uh, submit this resignation or this process, I was... I was not even home, I was receiving treatment. But by that time, I was taken off the payroll. So it was the the current situation at the time that put me under pressure because I was facing foreclosure, my credit was shot, I was already getting behind with all my payments. And that's what made it a challenge for me where if I don't, I said, if I don't submit this resignation, of course, my, my response was, well, I'll submit a medical uh, request for medical retirement because I had over 10 years of service so I said, I should be given that opportunity to at least the medically retire. You eventually go to court, you win your case, state of Texas appeals, and the case goes to the Supreme Court. And ultimately the Supreme Court, you know, held in your favor that, that you were due benefits. 
Significant ruling today from the Supreme Court involving a case that is centered right here in Texas. Justices saying that states can be sued by veterans who are alleging discrimination in the workplace. That's one part of your success in terms of advocating for yourself and, and others like you. But let's talk about what made you decide to create Burn Pits 360? You know, uh, Burn Pits 360, actually, we, we had no... Uh, no intention of starting a nonprofit. All this started from uh, the delay and denial experience that 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 I faced, that my wife faced in 2010 as I was being wheeled into the operating room. My wife, she told me, no matter the outcome, no matter the results that we get, I'm going to fight for you, and I'm going to fight for others because this is not going to be the end. So, Burnpist Six's inception came about. Uh, after our personal experience with delay and denial in seeking specialized health care. This is how it came about. It started on our kitchen table, knowing that the challenges that we faced, that we were not the only ones, that there was going to be so many others that were had already been affected and that were going to be affected in the future. And knowing that the challenges that I faced, not only serving as a reservist, but also the challenges that we're faced against with the VA, and then a civilian employer, that's what just put this, um, it lit this fire within us to not give up and, and, and to face the many challenges that, that we were facing at the time and the challenges that still continue to this day. You know, I've, I've read that the President Biden has said that he believes that his son's brain cancer and death was caused by exposure to burn pits. And now you enter this phase where, where you're on Capitol Hill and you're lobbying for legislation that becomes known as, as PACT. What's the connection between what you're lobbying for in terms of legislation and the compensation that was given to survivors of 9-11? The PACT Act, oh, wow, it's just uh, uh, monumental legislation. Veterans who were exposed to burn pits, Agent Orange, and other toxic substances can now receive additional health care and benefits from the Veterans Affairs. The care is available through the PACT Act. It's knowing that uh, the, the challenges that how we got there uh, throughout the years going to, uh, to D.C. and the many walks that we did, uh, those hallways, sharing our story, our personal journey, along other families, uh, some who are no longer here. Uh, one in particular, Staff Sergeant Thompson, rest in peace, walked the hallways. He passed on in uh, December of 2021. But knowing the, the impact that this legislation would do was something that was uh, beyond our, our imagination. And that is still surreal to this day. And, and that honoring our PACT Act it's, has been something that has been uh, for, for many years and my wife, we would talk about like as many times that as doors were closed, uh, or would no, you can't. There's no presumptive, but we can, we can do this because, uh, of, you know, there was always a dollar sign behind the issue. It's about money. Uh, I was told by a member of Congress, I can't sign a blank check. Well, sir, I signed two. I signed two blank checks, one for my state, and one for this nation. So, what does PAC stand for? Uh, uh PACT. Uh, Excuse my, sorry, but uh, Jay, my... Uh, no, no, okay, take your time. Yeah. Uh, so sorry, I need to my... I'm having, that's one of the challenges today that I've had that I still want my, uh, my cognitive is, uh, is still a, a challenge. And, uh, I understand that the members of Congress were able to understand the correlation between the benefits that they gave to survivors of 9-11 and the, the exposure to toxic materials that they inhaled at, at the site of the 9-11 tragedy at Ground Zero and the toxins that you and other soldiers ingested at the burn pits. So. How was that? Who made that correlation? Which legislator was behind you in, in helping to to push this forward? 
at that time, uh, I remember it was Congressman uh, Joaquin Castro, Congressman Dries in California, who were very receptive and uh, knowing that we were not receiving the support from our local member of Congress here in my region, Congressman Dries was uh, one in particular and him being a, a, a medical doctor, he knew and he believed, especially knowing that he had a constituent who, who suffered and who he visited with before she passed away. He believed in the issue and he knew that this was something that, that had to come to for, for the, uh, the PAC that to come forward and, and to move to, to, uh, to give us that, that blanket of, of, of specialized healthcare for so many of us. And I think when they, when some were allowed for, for that they opened their hearts to, to know what really happened to us. Like, for example, just to me, of many stories, sharing my, my personal journey is what really triggered some of these uh, members of Congress to move forward and support us because it was, uh, this was real. And, and I think when they saw the, the impact that it made in their, in their districts and when they went to visit these soldiers, these veterans who were struggling and who, who died, that's, I believe that's when the table started to turn and where they acknowledge, hey, we need to, we need to, to make this right. We need to correct this wrong, because there's, there's so many of us that, that are going to be affected. And what was the role that John Stewart had? Because I, John Stewart's been very outspoken about the fact that, as you said, you know, we send men and women off to to war who give up the ultimate sacrifice of their lives or come back with with serious illness and injuries, and then we don't we don't support them when they come back. America's heroes who fought in our wars outside sweating their asses off with oxygen, battling all kinds of ailments, while these motherfuckers sit in the air conditioning, walled off from any of it. They don't have to hear it. They don't have to see it. They don't have to understand that these are human beings. Do you get it yet? So how, how effective was Jon Stewart's speaking out in his advocacy in terms of getting his legislation passed. Knowing the work that he did with the 9-11 first responders, I remember in 2019, the fall of 2019, my wife had set up a meeting and actually met, uh, talked to John Feel with the, the Feel Good Foundation. And I reached out, hey, John, is it possible to maybe meet up or even just to have a conversation with John Stewart about the issue that we're facing? because it was very similar it goes to the 9-11 exposure. And uh, sure enough, I was received a FaceTime call and it was John Stewart on my wife's phone. He goes, hey, it's John. And just, he goes, hey, I heard about, I said, I'm sorry about your job loss, first of all, and I'm sorry what you're going through. You know, I said, hey, we did it for 9-11. First responders, we're gonna help veterans out and I'm gonna be a voice. And uh, John kept his word throughout those years and he, he became a, uh, a, a strong supporter of uh, us pushing the, the PACT Act. And the PACT Act is the, uh, what it stands for, is the promise to address comprehensive toxics act. And of course it was it was named after uh, Sergeant First Class Heath Robinson uh, in his honor with this PACT uh, that it was named after. After the legislation uh, was passed, did you have a chance to speak to President Biden? Uh, actually, we were, we were standing next to President Biden uh, of the signing of the, the bill. And I did have an opportunity to present him one of our uh, challenge coins of Berkeley 360. And that day I saw the uh, commander in chief as a father uh, who had lost a loved one to, to uh, toxic exposure. And I remember I presented that coin to him and uh, it was well accepted, you know, and just knowing the effort that led to us to be there that day. It was just beyond imaginable knowing that, that you know, going back 13 years, how long that we uh, had to push this issue, that it finally, you know, all the work finally come to fruition throughout the years, the challenges that we faced. Leroy, you and your wife and, and countless others, I congratulate you on your success of everything that you've done for our country. I know it's been a really long journey and I wish you good health going forward. What do you think is next for you? Oh, Jay, you know, there, there's uh, 
now that the PACT Act has passed and now it's the implementation, we thought things would slow down, but it's like the work continues. Our organization is focused on the implementation phase. Of course, at the same time, my journey is still not over with my job loss case. It's actually scheduled for trial later this month. So uh, it's been rather nerve wracking for me these couple of weeks, <laughs> just getting ready for that. Worst case scenario, if we happen to go to, to trial at the end of this month. But uh, the way ahead for us is, is that the work continues on the implementation phase and as well as uh, seeking other health modalities. We've been networking with this company, uh, 4D Medical, who does uh, four-dimensional lung imaging. I actually had my lungs scanned up in, in Miami back in early January of this year. So it's just now looking at, at non-invasive health technologies where veterans don't have to go through a lung biopsy like I did and have to go through a year of recovery from, from the surgery. But knowing that there's these technologies out there that will hopefully help, help veterans that are dealing with issues like myself. And there's some that are still working, but yet are having difficulty with their respiratory conditions because they're afraid to say something because they don't want to get fired or they don't want to lose their job. So it's, it's uh, the way ahead on how can we make those non-invasive technologies available to veterans. So that's what we're pushing for now. How can our listeners support the work you're doing? What can they do to help Burn Pits 360? They can actually go, go to our, our website. And just to add to that, there is a documentary in the works. It's called Thank You for Your Service, a Burn Pits story. It's in the making, but if they go to our, our burnpits360.org page, to our blog page, you can, uh, you can of course, you can support our, our efforts. Also support our programs. One of our programs is the the Warrior Hope Network, which we um, were able to provide, uh, for example, uh, concentrators, like you see me wearing this concentrator. Thankfully, I have Medicare, so I got mine through Medicare, but those veterans who only have VA, and it may be difficult for them uh, to uh, provide this type of equipment, but that's one thing that we do, that we, we're able to, to help uh, veterans just to make their quality of life better. We've already also uh, purchased uh, several hyperbaric chambers to help with those veterans receive treatment at home for their uh, either traumatic brain injury or their toxic brain injuries and so forth. So it's, it's some of the work that we that we are doing alongside with uh, networking with our stakeholders who are, are providing these non-invasive technologies like, like 4D Medical. And even looking at stem cell, I myself, I had stem cell last year, bioaccelerator. Uh, I had to travel out of the country to receive it, but I, I believe in it and I have faith that it's, that it's made a difference. I'm hopeful that uh, it will continue to, to, to work for me. But the work's gonna continue for us at Burn Pitch 360. Well, Captain Leroy Torres, I really wanna thank you for your service to our country, which came at a heavy cost for you and your family. And thank all those other veterans out there who've served our country and are suffering. And thank you for your, for your service to the state of Texas. You've gone above and beyond for, for us. And thank you for being my guest on All About Change. I wish you good health, as I said, and I hope you go from success to success. You've had a tremendous amount of success in advocacy, and I hope you continue to have more. So thank you. Uh, most welcome, Jay, and thank you for, for having me as well. Have a blessed afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Breathing is something I take for granted. For Leroy Torres, it's a struggle he'll face for the rest of his life his lungs permanently damaged from exposure to toxic fumes. Having him on the show, speaking with him about his journey while witnessing the reality of his injuries firsthand was incredibly moving. But the idea of him using his breath and his voice, straining himself in order to advocate for thousands of other veterans like him, that is truly courageous and an example we can all learn from. That's all for today's episode. In two weeks, we'll close out our conversation around veterans with actor, speaker, and author J.R. Martinez in a conversation that will span from harrowing encounters with IEDs to dancing with the stars, from struggling to help yourself to finding a calling and helping others. Today's episode was produced by Rebecca Chasson, story editing by Yochai Metal and Mijon Zulu. To check out more episodes or learn more about the show, you can visit our website, allaboutchangepodcast.com, 
and follow me on Twitter at jruderman. If you like our show, spread the word. Tell a friend or family member or leave us a review on your favorite podcasting app. We would really appreciate it. All About Change is produced by the Ruderman Family Foundation. Special thanks to our production team at Pod People, David Zwick, Grace Pina, Morgan Foos, Brian Rivers, and Amy Machado. That's all for now. I'm Jay Ruderman, and we'll see you next time on All About Change. Au revoir, but not good.